welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek. And as promised, we are continuing our discussion of ancient Phoenician culture. We said we would cover the alphabet, as they are often credited with one of the earliest alphabets, especially phonetic alphabets. In fact, the name phonetic comes from Phoenicia, interestingly enough. Um, and the Punic Wars. We're going to probably not talk too much about the Punic Wars because we'll get to that when we get to Rome. Um, but we do have some other history and biblical prophecy to wrap in. So let's start with the alphabet. I think this holds a special charm for me. When I was a kid, I would open up my dictionary and see all the different forms of the letters. Uh, you know, when you turn to the B's and the A's and whatever letter, it showed me like, here's what the Greek equivalent is. Here's what the... Arabic equivalent is, and the Phoenician was always the most interesting to me. I don't know why. Oh, well, before we turn this over to Rachel to do that, let me add my childhood experience mm. during the, uh, I must have been the 68 World Series or so, our teacher brought the television into the classroom to watch the World Series all day long, <laughs> and not being interested <laughs> in such things. American education. Yeah, here. not being interested in such things. I pulled out the World Book Encyclopedia, what? which was aimed at children mostly in those days. And the first entry for every letter was on that letter. And they showed you they, what they thought was the development of the alphabet from Egyptian hieroglyphics or Phoenician and Greek to the Roman alphabet. And I, as I memory serves me, that was the order they put things in. Um, and so I spent a lot of time looking at that and copying that. But now Rachel's going to come and talk to us about what she's discovered about alphabetic origins. Rachel? Yes. So I did a little bit more digging and was thinking it didn't really make sense theologically to me that we would find the first alphabetical form of writing among Phoenicians and that we, we would then see God's people learn from them around the time, after the time actually, of Solomon to be able to write in that type of writing. Because what you had before with hieroglyphics and cuneiform and what we see even today in uh, Chinese writing and Japanese writing is you tend to have a lot of symbols that are for single words or for parts of words. And so you end up needing to learn a thousand or a couple thousand symbols to actually be able to read and write versus an These alphabet. Like pictographic. Right. Languages. Pictographic or just there. Some of them are still just symbols, but it's like, this is the symbol for this prefix. You have to learn mm -hmm. this prefix mm -hmm. symbol. Um, Versus an alphabet, you learn, depending on the alphabet, 22 to 26 letters, and you can suddenly write everything, which is why it's considered a huge technological innovation and is essential if you're going to be writing a lot of different things um, and even needing new words and things like that. What we tend to see in the older writing of um, the cuneiform and hieroglyphics, also most of those words and writings were for the elite, meaning mm -hmm. it was for administrative recording or for magic spells. So if you're thinking, well, then how did the books, the parts of the books of Genesis, of the book of Genesis, and then the whole Torah, how did they write that? Because we believe that that was definitely before the time of Solomon and what would have been available according to modern scholarship would basically be Egyptian hieroglyphics, which is not what we believe Moses wrote in. Uh, we believe he wrote in Hebrew. So some people will say, oh, you're crazy. Moses just knew Egyptian and that's what he wrote in. Um, or he didn't write it at all. That's the more common consensus. Um, <laughs> But when you start to look behind the outward layer of scholarship, you can find a number of uh, Bible-believing scholars who have looked deeper and have actually found that the there are some older inscriptions that they date. They are from the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, so that would put them towards the 1700-1800 BC that are clearly an early alphabet, but they are based upon... Uh, hieroglyphic symbols, but they're not using them the same way. They're using them as letters. And if you start to look at them and what they pictorially represent, you can see how they would potentially correspond to Hebrew words. Like a little mm. wave, which looks like water, corresponds to the M letter, which in Hebrew is mayim, which is the word for water. Mm. 
So Mm. there have been scholars that have started looking at that. Others say, no, it can't possibly be. That's just a nice made up story because it doesn't fit their worldview. Um, But what it seems to show is there are early examples of an alphabet that predates the Phoenician alphabet that currently gets the credit as the first one that then developed over about 800 years to eventually become what we know as the Phoenician alphabet. And when you see Phoenician alphabet uh, appearances, which there's only a couple of them early on, and you also start to see what they call Old Hebrew, those two are really, really similar when they start around 900 BC. And then the Phoenician alphabet significantly changes over time, whereas the Hebrew alphabet seems to stay mostly the same, as though it's based, whatever they're both based on, Hebrew was much more similar to versus uh, Phoenician. But what all this means, taking the bottom line, is that rather than saying, oh, there was this other alphabet, other language that we don't know about that appeared in the Sinai and then in Canaan in the time when the people of God would have been conquering the land and when Moses would have been writing his books, um, instead of saying this was some other language that we don't know about, it's if we take the Bible seriously, it's more likely that that was actually the early form of Hebrew that they wrote in. And Occam's that, razor is on our side here. <laughs> right, because they're the, <laughs> the ones that would have been most using alphabets like that uh, at the time, particularly um, with the coming of Moses, who's now has so many things to write down that God keeps saying, write this in the book, write this in the book, record this, the people need this. But also our theology should tell us that God will provide a means for his people to keep a record of his word. He won't leave them with no means of recording what he said, because we know that oral traditions are not very reliable. And a lot of modern scholarship are saying, oh, the Bible is not reliable because they had no way to write it down. <laughs> and it, it wasn't, it must not have been Whoa. written down till, it yeah, must it must not have been written down till like 400 BC. So of course the Exodus has been highly inflated and exaggerated, da, 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 da. This is just because, hilarious because of how many, con- how many times God commands his people to read aloud the law, which you can only do if it's been written which, down. That's one of the <laughs> other funny things is they say, oh, well, they were all illiterate. It, and <laughs> so they couldn't have written these things down and nobody could have read them because they were illiterate. Well, maybe a lot of the people were, but that's why you read out loud. <laughs> Everybody didn't have a copy to read at home. Uh, so it's interesting as you delve deeper to find the ways in the alphabet um, that God actually provided first for his people. And then others like the Phoenicians seem to have benefited from the wealth of God's people as they had more contact with them around the time of David and Solomon. And Which that's is where called the common alphabet. grace. <laughs> yeah, that is where the Phoenician alphabet seems to get its start um, in its first uh, known uh, historical representation is on a sarcophagus of a Hiram, who's the father mm-hmm. of Hiram. So there, it's just kind of an interesting way to see both if you take the evidential approach, but also the theological approach, the two things do you meet to show that God provides for his people. And it just goes to show how your assumptions can very much <laughs> determine the outcome of your research. <laughs> and, and that was what was so funny is it was like, as this man, I was watching a video and this man was looking into the evidence and he'd bring it back to the other, the scholars that denied the truth of the Bible. And they would just say, oh, no, that can't possibly be. No, that's just a nice story. No, no. And it, but they would never actually be able to historically prove that these people were wrong. They would just say, no, that can't be. It doesn't fit. No, no. Um, a couple things sort of is uh, backfiller for which that was excellent, Rachel, for what you've just said. Adam wrote a book. It's called The mm-hmm. Book of Adam. Mm-hmm. It uh, is more or less chapters two, three, and I think four of Genesis. Uh, the book of the generations of Adam, or the book of Adam. <clears throat> book implies writing, and yeah, as you said, not in hieroglyphics or some other pictographic form. Now, the Tower of Babel probably changed things, because now people speaking many different languages would not find it so easy to tie those languages to 
the alphabet they knew. And thus we can expect after Babel to see the nations trying to regain a way of writing. But as you've pointed out, this would likely be, the practical uses are state bureaucracy, magic, and to a much lesser degree, um, sales, mm -hmm. because that can largely be numbers with a few tick marks to tell you what you're selling. You don't need a lot. But magic and bureaucratic instructions tend to require something. Remember, when the hieroglyphics were called hieroglyphics, because hiero means priestly and glyphic means writing. <laughs> and when people look at them, they said, oh, this is obviously a priestly code that uh, tells us of magical things. Even though we can't read it, we will assume that's what it is. So that much. Uh, another thing, uh, a reason that hieroglyphics could not have been used for writing scripture is originally, at least to a large extent, it was pictographic. And so if you wanted to speak of God, you would draw a picture of God. <laughs> There's a problem. fundamental problem with the second commandment <laughs> yes. right there. That's not uh, how God wants to be represented. God does not want to be represented in pictures. He communicates through language. And Jesus is mm -hmm. the eternal word of God, not the eternal picture of God. Although it's true, the scripture does use image. But it corrects that, or not corrects, but complements and redefines that by telling us, well, what is the image? God is spirit. He reveals himself in his word, in his son. And his son speaks to us in words. And so we should expect we should expect that what happened after Babel was very similar to what we're seeing today. The, this argument over whether or not God, truth, and reality is best communicated through pictures and images, or whether it's best communicated through words. And the whole, as you've said, the whole history of the Old Testament is read these words. Every seventh year, read this law. Uh, say these words when you come to worship God. Hear the word of the Lord over and over again. So those are just some things. If, if anybody out there is a budding linguist or, or a phonetician and wants to start studying language in the light of God's word, these are just some things to, to think about. We haven't exhausted it by any means. And no doubt there are many questions to answer, but these are good starting points. Now, you mentioned Hiram, and that brings us to Hiram. <laughs> <laughs> nice segue. There were, now, you, in your case, you, it was Hiram, son of Hiram, right? So two kings? Yeah, a, Hi a Hiram, son of, who is father to Hiram. So I believe okay. a Hiram is the one that knew David, and then uh -huh. Hiram, his son, is the one that works with Solomon. Okay. So very similar. Uh, what part does this play in scripture? Well, we're told that that Hiram, one of them, was always a lover of David. So this may have been the son as the father was going into retirement. I don't know the, the details here. But when he heard that Solomon had come to the throne and uh, Solomon sent him a message that said, we need, first of all, we need cedars. We've talked last time about the importance of the cedars of Lebanon. And if you guys, if you guys can cut down the cedars and ship them down the coast to Joppa, we'll pick them up there. We'll use them in construction of the temple to the great God. That that'd be wonderful. And Hiram says that's a good deal. And uh, Solomon then says, "And do you got somebody who knows a lot about craftsmanship and metallurgy and and all of that kind of thing?" And Hiram says, "I do. His name is Hiram." <laughs> <laughs> no, no relation, apparently. <laughs> uh, half Phoenician, half Israelite of the tribe of Although Dan. Although that would be really funny if he was talking about himself. Yeah. yeah. I'm really good. <laughs> it's me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in passing, just because I can't refrain, the whole Masonic system of symbols is built upon the, uh, the legend they've created of Hiram, the architect. Remember, the, the uh, Freemasonry revels in architectural figures, mm -hmm. and the story that they tell is that um, this Hiram knew the great mysteries of God, and, and they were wrapped up in the architecture of the temple, and that three of his boys came, three of his men came and said, we want to know the secrets. He refused to give them. They killed him, and that became the beginning of the Masonic oaths, the Masonic symbols, the Masonic imagery, and all that. We'll come back to that in a few years when we get <laughs> to the Enlightenment and uh, the repercussions of it, but just throwing that out now. 
For now, the one thing I think we should note is that when Solomon and Hiram have concluded their dealings, uh, Hiram praises the Lord God for giving Solomon to Israel as such a wise king. And Solomon has made a league with him, which strongly suggests, since this was before Solomon's fall, apparently, that Hiram actually became a God-fearer, that he actually acknowledged Jehovah as the God of the universe, at least set him above all of his little petty gods, and um, was more than willing to swear uh, in his name. So here we have the Phoenicians providing a tremendous service to God's people, providing not only the, the raw materials for the temple, but providing the oversight and craftsmanship to build the whole thing. Uh, but I think the the other thing we have to say to counterbalance that is David had received the floor plan for the temple in by revelation, by prophecy and vision. Hiram didn't get to decide what the temple would look like. Hiram did not get mm -hmm. to look around and say, well, what are Phoenician and Egyptian temples and Babylonian temples look like that? Let's do that. He had been told, this is the basic floor plan. Now, you can make it pretty. You can make it elegant. You can make it something that strives to be worthy of the God who made the universe. Uh, and so there's there's something here about God's common grace is uh, taking the wealth of even wicked nations and pouring it into the kingdom of God. But God's people still have God's word as a guide for what has to happen. Yeah, the, the gifts of the Spirit also. Um, mm -hmm. When we look back at the building of the tabernacle, the artisans and the people who built, who made all the decorative things, um, the Spirit of God gave them that that gift, yeah. um, the, that skill and that wisdom. Um, and I think that's very relevant to the Common Grace conversation too. Mm -hmm. That yeah. just as the 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 Noahic covenant was based on this blood sacrifice pointing to Jesus, mm -hmm. the gift of artisanship is from the Spirit of God. Yeah. Jesus is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. He mm -hmm. gives gifts to all people. Uh, God gives gifts to all people for the sake of his Son and for the sake of the church. And here we have a prime example. He doesn't say, you're a bunch of pagans, get out of here. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, in the Restoration time, when God's people are rebuilding the temple, the neighboring pagans come, pretending to be God-fearers, and say, let <laughs> yes. us help you. And Zerubbabel and Joshua say, no way, man. No, thank you. Are, you. <laughs> no, because we know your motives. You're not going to, you're not wanting to help us. You're wanting to get a hand on the wheel here and run things, and we're not going to do this. This is our calling before God. So two things that might seem similar, but in fact, the saints involved saw them as very different sorts of things. Well, from there, we begin blitzing through Old Testament history, through Solomon's fall, um, through the divided kingdom. In the northern kingdom, uh, where Jeroboam has set up the worship of golden calves, we see a number of dynasties come and go rather quickly, none of them lasting more than four generations, because God says that he visits the iniquity of idolaters to the third and fourth generation of them that hate him until we come to a man named Omri, who shows up in secular records and inscriptions. And he has a son, and he, builds, he buys a hill called, um, well, he calls it Samaria after the owner, whose <laughs> name is Shamar. And, he, and uh, Omri has a son named Ahab, and now Samaria has become the capital of northern Israel. And Ahab um, not only worships golden cows, this is what the text of scripture says about him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, um, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he'd built in Samaria. Abra, uh, Ahab also made a, a grove and a shirapol. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. And Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That's because one of the great storylines of the Old Testament, the confrontation between Elijah, 
on the one hand and uh, Ahab and the prophets of Baal on the other. A uh, couple things to note. As if it had been a light thing to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Jeroboam's sins were setting up golden calves and saying, this is Jehovah, this is Yahweh. This is the God that brought you out of Israel. He did not claim to be introducing a new God. He claimed that he was simply giving them a friendlier, more comfortable way to access the God they already knew. And he was tweaking some ceremonies and some rites here and there. But later on in the Minor Prophets, we find the Israelites and Northern Kingdom patting itself on the back because they do the third year tithe and they do the peace offerings. They do everything right, except they're worshiping through calves. Um, and, and so they, it, Israel by and large did not perceive itself as being guilty of class one idolatry, that is forsaking Jehovah. They just, and, and, and it wasn't really, you know, class two idolatry because they knew the cows weren't really Jehovah. They were just reminders and helpers and, all, mm -hmm. and that. Uh, it did amount to, however, Jeroboam kicking out all the faithful pastors, all the Levites who then fled to Judea, uh, and installing very corrupt religious leaders in the North. That's how things had been going, and every king who had come to the throne in the North had supported the system, and does, except for the one who lived a week and didn't have time. Um, <laughs> but uh, Ahab takes it more than a step further when he introduces Baal worship. He marries Isabel. Uh, Isabel. That's, that, that would be her name in Spanish, Isabella. Jezebel. <laughs> uh, and you can hear the name Bell there in the end. Uh, she's the daughter of Ethbaal. We know Ethbaal from also from secular records. He was a high priest um, in um, Zidon or Tyre. The two were closely related. Uh, who had assassinated the king and taken the throne? These were the lessons that Jezebel learned while watching. If you are <laughs> faithful to Baal, you make sure that the leader of the Baal cult is in control because that will seem at control and power. And so when she comes to Israel was married there. That's the lesson she brings with her. Someplace in America's probably 18th or more likely 19th century, the phrase painted Jezebel came along because when Jezebel confronts her, um, the one who will wreak vengeance upon her, Jehu, she paints her eyes and, and such, as if the great crime here is using makeup. <laughs> um, no, she was a queen, and she was getting ready to the very end to present herself as a queen, even in the face of this these um, ruffians who were coming to take her rightful kingdom from her. She played the hand straight from her point of view. The problem is her point of view was anti-God, vicious, um, and uh, thoroughly self-seeking in terms of power. We're, we're told in the next chapter, I, was, I just read the, the end of, this is 1 Kings 16 and the first couple of verses of 17. As that chapter goes on, that she tried to exterminate all the prophets of the Lord. He'd drive them out or kill them. And if uh, the steward of her own household had not intervened and hidden a hundred of them, uh, they all, except Elijah, would have been dead. Elijah was hidden by God himself. So one of you mentioned last time that uh, the Phoenicia, I think, Rachel, that Phoenicia was presented oftentimes as a tolerant religion. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> that they allowed all other religions into their religion. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me very much of today. All things are tolerated except Christianity. Except Christianity. Because yeah. we say no to everything else. Yeah. We're so unreasonable and, you know, that. Yes. Well, it's also kind of the syncretism that we see historically in the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Where, it, yeah, you can have all your, you know, Latin American traditional religions. You just have to put saints' names on them. Yeah. yeah, you just turned the moon into Mary and, yeah, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, and that's something of what Elijah was uh, about. He uh, he appears out of nowhere. Uh, he confronts Ahab and says, it's not going to rain until I say so. Now, this is important because remember, Baal is the god of the storms, and the rain, mm -hmm. the thunder, lightning. And so if Baal should be able to do anything, it should be to give showers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for three and a half years, it ain't happening. The land is going dry and Ahab and his steward have to go out and look for places uh, where there's some grass to keep the horses alive, not the people, 
But Ahab knows that when a, when a land is starving, it's open to invasion. He needs to keep his war machine up and running. Mm-hmm. And it's at this point that Elijah reveals himself and um, demands a challenge, a confrontation. He himself against the prophets of Baal. And that's the latter part of 17. And that's um, a callback to, to the gods of Egypt and the yeah. showdown with the Ten Plagues, which I don't think we really covered in depth. We, we didn't a The whole individual lot. plagues called out. Egyptian deities. Yeah, the turning the Nile into blood is an attack against Osiris, the god of death and resurrection. Uh, smiting the sun black, that's Ra and Horus, the sun gods, the land to lice, that's Isis, the fertility of the land. My favorite is is uh, the multiplication of frogs. That's an Mine attack. Too. <laughs> that's an attack on Haket, the frog-headed goddess who controlled the multiplying of frogs. She couldn't even manage that one. <laughs> Uh, and the text actually on some at some points does explicitly say that God was waging war, bringing judgment upon all the gods of Egypt, mm-hmm. both in, in their hypothetical theological form, but also in terms of the animals that were worshipped as incarnations of these animals. A lot of them just flat out died when the plagues hit the animals. Mm-hmm. So all of that's going on. Well, meanwhile, back here, I said 17, but it actually follows on into 18. Uh, Elijah says, okay, we're going to Mount Carmel and we're going to have a contest there. Now, a couple things. Carmel, that's the bottom of Lebanon. That's Baal's backyard. So we're going, you, you want to see how powerful Baal is? Let's go play in Baal's backyard. Car- Mount Carmel is a mountain. It's near the clouds. <laughs> we'll give you a home court advantage on that one. Let's make it really easy for Baal. Um, furthermore, I'm the only one of the prophets of the Lord left, as far as he knew at that point, but you have 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, um, of the groves. And that doesn't include any prophets of, um, the calves that apparently were left out of this one because that wasn't the issue. So it's one against, it's, the odds are almost, wow, not quite one against a thousand, but you know, it's, it's getting up there. Uh, and then just to make the thing interesting, he says, and let's douse the sacrifices with water. Uh, Mm -hmm. actually, no, he does that for himself. He makes it hard for Jehovah. He, all he says to them is you go first. So home court advantage, it's Baal's backyard. It's a mountain. You got a whole lot more of you and you get to go first. And all you have to do is produce fire from heaven. This is Baal stock and trade. This is what he's supposed to be able to do. He hadn't done it for three and a half years, but hey, maybe he's been busy. So if you it's can- also go ahead. not a, a naturalistic approach to the problem, to the no. challenge to say you go first. It would like, you'd think they would set them up side by side and say, yeah. whichever one gets it first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what he does. No, you can have, you can have lots of time. And he, they start at the time of the morning sacrifice and they go to the time of the evening sacrifice. So that's from someplace like nine- in the morning at three in the afternoon. Um, and we all love the part where about halfway through around noon, he starts mocking them yeah. <laughs> because some things are worthy of mockery. <laughs> and he says, uh, as the King James renders it, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he's talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. Um, he is pursuing, he's turned aside is a euphemism for he's going to the bathroom. This is not polite. <laughs> this is, <laughs> he's, he's mocking this would-be God very openly. Meanwhile, the prophets of Baal are doing what prophets of Baal do. They are cutting themselves and letting the blood flow to shock nature into giving uh, an unusual response, instantaneous rain. And nothing's happening. And this continues until the time of the evening offering. This is around three o'clock. When Elijah finally says, okay, that's enough. You're done. Boof. And he goes and finds uh, an old altar to the Lord that had been torn down, consisting of 12 stones, testifying to the unity of the nation, which has been divided by the, the golden calves and all that now by Baal worship. And he has them dig a trench around the altar and then orders 
water poured on it. Fill four barrels of water and pour it on the sacrifice and do it a second time, do it a third time. Twelve barrels of water. Symbolic of what he's asking for. But again, the twelveness. He's, he's driving home the covenant apostasy of northern Israel. And then he goes to God, and whereas the prophets of Baal have been saying, oh, Baal, hear us, oh, Baal, hear us, hear us, Baal. Oh, you can imagine that going on for a long time. He simply says, he has one repetition. He says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, that's God's sovereignty, that I am your servant, that's representation, that I've done all these things by thy word, that's stipulations. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, the one repetition, because now he's going to ask for sanctions, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And the question of continuity, of course, is the one that's open. What will Israel do with this? Well, fire falls from heaven, consumes the sacrifice, the stones, the water, and all the people shout, Jehovah, he is the God. And it is, it is a victory for the day. Uh, Elijah has the people corral all the prophets of Baal who are idolaters on Israel's soil, and therefore their lives are forfeit, and he executes them. And then prays for rain, and God gives rain. And we all know the story of the the little little cloud rising like the mm-hmm. size of a man's hand that suddenly darkens the sky, and Elijah runs in the power of the Spirit of God all the way back to uh, to Jezreel ahead of Ahab's chariot. And it looks like a great day. And then Jezebel sends a little note to Elijah that says, you are so dead, and he runs mm-hmm. for it. And that does not end the conflict there. It will take uh, Elisha, Elijah's successor, anointing a man named Jehu, a captain of Ahab's host, to be the grand executioner, not only of Ahab's household, of Jezebel, uh, but of also of all the Baal worshippers in Israel. And that ends that intrusion for now. But as we go on reading through the Old Testament histories, every now and then, one of the kings of the north and even the kings of the south will continue to have this flirtation with his power religion, Baalism, because, well, it's about power. And if you can get on the right side of Baal, then you are the guy with the power, and everyone has to obey you and listen to you and do what you say. Uh, And this continues, really, until the captivity, and we don't see it come back in that form again. But it is um, a long-running contender with biblical faith through all of this. It is interesting in the face of so much opposition, when Tyre and Sidon come to Israel, they tend to bring destruction with them to to the people as they try to take over. But we see multiple instances where Israelites go to Tyre and Sidon. Uh, For example, Elijah going to Sidon, right, as Mm. he's running from Jezebel. Uh, But uh, also we see later in the Gospels where Jesus Mm -hmm. actually chooses to go and has um, an interaction with a Syrophoenician woman who he praises for the greatness of her faith because Mm -hmm. she understands uh, the covenant and her place, but also um, the graciousness of God. And so mm-hmm. most of what we see from Tyre and Sidon is very negative, and we're going to look at some of their judgments from God. But there are these little glimpses of hope that even in the midst of this, um, the Lord is, as we say, converting the nations and calling the nations to be blessed in Abraham. So the first of the judgments that we see comes in Isaiah in chapter 23. Um, And we talked about Tyre as a merchant people. And so we can see where this comes up in their judgment, where it says, the burden of Tyre, howl ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no entering in. From the land of Kittim, it is revealed to them. Be still ye inhabitants of the isle, Thou whom the merchants of Zidon that pass over the sea have replenished, and by great waters the seed of Sihor, the harvest of the river, is her revenue, and she is a mart of nations. Be thou ashamed, O Sidon, for the sea has spoken, even the strength of the sea, saying, I travail not, nor bring forth children, neither do I nourish up young men, nor bring up virgins. As As at the report concerning Egypt, so shall they be sorely pained at the report of Tyre. Pass ye over to Tarshish, 
Howl, ye inhabitants of the isle. Is this your joyous city, whose antiquity is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her far off to sojourn. And so it continues. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed it to stain the pride of all glory and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. Pass through thy land as a river, O daughter of Tarshish, there is no more strength. And so he carries on. The other place where we see uh, the discussions of Tyre are in Ezekiel 26 and 28. In 26, it says, beginning at verse 2, Son of man, because that Tyrus hath said against Jerusalem, Ah, she is broken. That was the gates of the people. She is turned unto me. I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and will make her like the top of a rock. So we see that attempt to again take advantage of the people of God. And the Lord's response is to scrape her literally all the way to the ground where there is nothing left for a time. And all the glory of Tyre is brought to nothing. And if as you many read, different nations come. Yeah, as you read just a little bit further, I was trying to remember where this was, and it's right here. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I've spoken, mm -hmm. and saith the Lord God. It shall become a spoil to the nations. Verse 7, And thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and chariot, and so on. Now, the I was, before we were um, recording, I was making a big deal about this idea of the nations coming like waves. Wave comes after wave. Tyre did not perish in a moment. Nebuchadnezzar came with his army and laid waste to it, but it rebuilt. And they rebuilt on an island just a little ways off the coast and was flourishing quite nicely, thank you, until Alexander comes along. So we've gone from Nebuchadnezzar to the Persians to Alexander. And Alexander demands Tyre's surrender, and they laugh at him. They taunt him. And he, that's not something you do to a would-be son of God. <laughs> so he gets really upset, and he orders his army to turn themselves into engineers and sweep the remains of old Tyre out into uh, the ocean as a causeway to new Tyre, and then marches out there and takes the city and destroys it. And as Ezekiel tells us, it's never rebuilt. It's today is a place where people fish. It's gone forever. So that's that's a little bit of the judgment. It's mentioned also, I believe in Jeremiah, I know in Zechariah, um, but I do appreciate especially you mentioning the Syrophoenician woman because, mm -hmm. yes. And we all know a young man who is Lebanese. If Joshua had destroyed all the Canaanites, our dear friend wouldn't be here. Oh, no. <laughs> Instead, he is a godly man serving the Lord. So God's grace continues, and it's greater than his cursing always. He's, mm -hmm. the, the death of Christ is so much more valuable than even the penalty our sins incurred. And so there's a great, great deal to thank God for here on the eve of uh, Resurrection Sunday. One last thing about this, we, we shift with the destruction of uh, Tyre and Sidon, we shift to Carthage, which was a colony far to the west on the coast of North Africa. The, according to legend and tradition, the crowning or the um, founding queen was one Dido, who is the same Dido who gave aid and comfort to Aeneas as he was fleeing <laughs> the uh, destruction of Troy. So that begins to put things in perspective. Uh, Jezebel was a great aunt. So there are connections here. Uh, the Carthaginians continued the Phoenician custom of being mariners, middlemen, merchants going to the far corners of the earth. And we'll talk more about this, I think, when we get, as, as uh, Emily said earlier, when we get to Rome. But there are increasing hints, like large stashes of Carthaginian coins found in weird places. And 
uh, statuary that look like cheap imitations, cheap knockoffs of um, Babylonian and Assyrian products showing up in all kinds of places like the Americas. <laughs> um, the suggestion by uh, Professor Barry Fell of Harvard was this, and I'll just throw it out there for now. We can come back and talk about it another time. That the Carthaginians not only discovered the Ten Islands, Britain, but they also managed to circumnavigate Africa. And there are actually literary sources that speak of their trip and how the sun suddenly was on the wrong side of the of the uh, equator as they sailed, which happens <laughs> if you sail below it. Um, <laughs> the wrong side, meaning the other yeah, side. <laughs> yeah. And um, also a uh, uh, something left behind by, by Plutarch, which describes uh, a journey to something that, from their point of view, was furthest west. And as you track the, the physical description, you have this, these, these little islands outside Britain, and then you have this bigger f island, and you have this frozen sea, and then you come to this land where Greek people settled for a while. Like, this sounds like a trip to North America. Uh, Barry Fell's take on this is that the Carthaginians did develop some kind of regular trading route uh, into the Americas, and they would take their knockoff products that they had made cheaply, trade them to the local inhabitants for things they didn't value as much, gold. <laughs> and along the way, as ballast, they pick up timber because the Carthaginians didn't have a lot of access to that. The Romans were beginning to control all of that. And then we brought it back. And this all went hunky-dory until the First Punic War, when Carthage effectively lost her fleet and lost control of the Mediterranean and the, uh, and the gates of Heracles and her access to America. And so America is forgot. These rich lands that they had kept secret are forgot. And uh, Carthage has to shift from being a naval power to being a military power. As you look at the stories that surround the Second Punic War, those are the ones with Hannibal and the elephants and all that. Uh, well, suddenly we're not fighting in the ocean anymore. We're fighting on land because for some reason, um, lumber was no longer available. So those are some things we can look at later when we get to Rome. I don't vouch for all of it, but uh, <laughs> I will recommend one of Professor Bell's Fell's books here in just a moment. Speaking of recommendations, why don't you do that now? <laughs> I will do that now. <laughs> Professor Barry Fell is a controversial figure in um, pre-Columbian American studies, and I would not take everything he says as gospel. For one thing, he is uh, a translator of a form of written communication called Ogham, and he has been challenged on his translations um, with some degree of convincingness. But when he records, look, this guy found these coins here, that's that's a different kind of evidence. Or these inscriptions were found here, and whether or not we agree on what they say, the language is a whole lot closer to Phoenician or Greek or something else than anything else we know. And it does not translate into any of uh, the Indian dialects, except when the Indian dialects seem to rely heavily on Greek, <laughs> you know, these kind of things. So uh, I will recommend two of his books, America B.C., Ancient Settlers in the New World, and Saga America, um, Startling New Theory of Old World Settlement of America Before Columbus. And again, uh, with a grain of salt, but there is enough in here, I think, that is worth the time of anybody who wants to begin to get their feet wet in this stuff. And particularly in Saga America, chapters three and four are about the Phoenicians and evidence of Phoenician um, activity in America. And most of it has not to do with inscriptions. Most of it has to do with coins and cultural artifacts. So America BC, Saga America, Barry Fell. Very good. I'm going to recommend something totally irrelevant, um, something that I thought I would never have as too extra, um, and that is a mini fridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like with with pregnancy, uh, temperature is very important, right? You, you got to have the bubbly drink and, you know, as soon as it gets warm, it's no good anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is annoying when you sleep upstairs and your fridge is downstairs. Mm. Um, so just on a whim, my dear husband, David, our producer, uh, 
just looked up on Amazon how much it was for a mini <laughs> fridge. And they're like $35. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was oh, like, wow. what? I never imagined that it would be so affordable. Um, so this is probably the most extra thing I own, except for maybe the the mug that has like Bluetooth connectivity and keeps your drink oh, hot. Oh, you have one of those? My wife has been wanting one of those. They... I hate how much I love it because it's totally <laughs> extra and luxurious um, and it's amazing. <laughs> um, so same, same concept, you know, beverages at the right temperature. Um, right. Mm -hmm. The mini fridge is much cheaper than the mug that keeps your drink Yeah, hot. that's what we heard. That's why we haven't bought one of those yeah. cups yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, they do make great gifts if that's your, your <laughs> gift budget. Um, but go. yeah, I think we got this little fridge. It's tiny, um, but I think we got it like refurbished. So it was very, very unbelievably affordable. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's my recommendation. Rachel? All right. Well, I'm going to recommend the video that I got a good bit of the information I shared uh, or from, from which I got the, the information I shared on the alphabet. Um, it's another one in the series of videos called Patterns of Evidence made by Timothy Mahoney. And this one is called The Moses Controversy that came out in 2019. So where he is diving into all of the, the evidence about alphabets and such things. So okay. Very cool. And what's the name of it again? Uh, so it's Patterns of Evidence, The Moses Controversy, which I initially thought it was going to be, did Moses exist? Uh, the controversy <laughs> is actually about did Moses really write the Torah and how could he have written the Torah and you know when was the Torah written all of that sort of thing very cool all right thank you both so much for this conversation it's been a delight uh, thanks also to David our producer and my lawfully wedded husband and thank you to our financial supporters we appreciate you keeping the show rolling Dear listener, if you would like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening.